Hello, everyone, and welcome to Navigating Open Source Project Hurdles to Achieve Community Empowerment, or How the Heck Do You Get Through Graduation? Um, just as a quick poll of the audience, how many are potentially considering submitting a project to the CNCF? Ooh. Okay. How many are associated with a project in Sandbox? Okay. How about incubating? Okay, no one at that tier. Uh, graduated? I know you are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so with that, uh, my name is Bob Killen. I am known as Mr. Bobby Tables across all the things. Uh, I am a program manager for Google's open source programs office. Uh, I am also a member of the Kubernetes steering committee and chair of SIG contributor experience. And I'm Ijemal Nurmamad Kuzi. I am a director of DevRel in a company called Sysdig. Um, we also open source donated uh, a project to CNCF called Falco that provides runtime security for Kubernetes containers cloud. And uh, previously, I was with Bob Killen in uh, uh, Google's OSPO, where we work with many different projects, both CNCF and not CNCF including projects like Knative and Istio that we help to uh, open source and donate uh, to CNCF. Um, but what people don't know about us is that Bob and I, uh, we started a, a project called Alpaca, and it's totally real uh, project. Uh, it's a software packaging with middle out compression, so very real. <laughs> And we think it adds uh, a lot of value to the cloud native ecosystem. And we're wondering, oh, why don't we donate it to CNCF? So it's uh, quite safe to say that CNCF is one of the most well-known foundations and it's got a lot of support. It, it's like it has really wide uh, ecosystem with many vendors, many players, many developers and projects uh, within it. And um, there's a lot of interest and momentum for cloud-native software. Uh, but CNCF is also very, very big, right? It can feel like it's like very overwhelming landscape, and it often uh, feels so. So how do we know that CNCF is the right place for our little alpaca? Um, so we ask ourselves a question. Is my project right for CNCF? Uh, CNCF says that the project is a good fit um, if it furthers the mission of CNCF, which is to make the cloud native computing ubiquitous. Some examples they give is software uh, that extends or integrates uh, with an existing CNCF project like Kubernetes or uh, software that um, fulfills the current need, um, like WASM. Um, Alpaca lets us package and compress uh, software to ship across the cloud, so we think it's a good fit. Uh, by the way, it's totally real. <laughs> uh, however, that decision might be different depending on your project. There are other foundations out there with different cultures, with different focus, uh, and sometimes when you apply to CNCF Sandbox, the Technical Oversight Committee, they may recommend you to join uh, other foundations that might be a better fit for your project. And examples of those foundations is like other foundations under LF umbrella, like AI and data. There's also Apache Software Foundation. Uh, there's Open Infra Foundation. And they have all like different like goals, purposes, and different culture uh, and focus. So. When you plan to open source your project, it's just choose whatever is close to your project and close to your heart. Um, and if you decide to join CNCF, right, uh, on a very high level, um, you get a few like, really important things that help uh, you grow your project. Uh, first thing is uh, visibility. CNCF is a large organization and projects get credibility by being part of it. Uh, they, also result, um, uh, they also receive like, marketing benefits uh, from the foundation that help you achieve uh, the visibility, and we'll dive into those a bit more later. Uh, being part of CNCF also helps you to be aligned with the uh, cloud-native ecosystem, right? When you join CNCF, you join 
a large community of cloud native projects and their maintainers. By being within it, you can work across CNCF and meet stakeholders from different projects and that help you align uh, your efforts with efforts of the rest of the players in the ecosystem. Um, and CNCF has also, um, also has a proven legal framework and it's one of the bigger benefits uh, of joining any foundation, right? They have lawyers that have built uh, the right licensing and ownership frameworks for the project so you don't really have to worry about that. As an example, like you isolate it uh, from any legal considerations from accepting contributions from different individuals or organizations. And usually that's a headache, like to set it up properly. Uh, but perhaps uh, the most important benefit that you get is a vendor, uh, vendor neutral home for your project. And this is uh, very important, like for multiple reasons. Um, this gives trust and peace of mind for users that choose to adapt your project. And when users and um, your users are people and companies, and uh, by seeing that your project is part of the CNCF, they will be sure that it will always stay open, the licenses won't change in future. And their governance framework also ensures that there's not a single vendor that drives all the decision uh, for the project. Um, okay. Uh, so, Apaka is, you know, loving the idea of being a CNCF project and, you know, your project may too. And within the CNCF, there are certain project maturity levels that roughly equate with the whole, you know, innovators, early adopters, and early majority uh, tiers of the crossing the chasm diagram. Um, we're all here at the, the CNCF. I'm sure everyone knows a good amount of this and don't have to dive into a lot of detail. But the tiers for us are, you know, sandbox, incubating, and graduated. So our wee little alpaca has decided, yes, it wants to join the CNCF. And it's still a very young project, so it's going to, you know, aim for sandbox. So with that, we let the journey begin and start to look at what it actually takes to become a sandbox project. Um, the requirements for uh, sandbox are not very strict, and that's by design. Um, the lack of strictness is to ensure the projects have the best chance for success. Uh, but before even uh, joining the sandbox, um, there are a few important considerations that anyone should understand. And Specifically, uh, you need to understand what happens to your intellectual property and what you will need to end up like transferring to CNCF. Uh, so you'll transfer a trademark, your logo, your domain name if you have, and it is a legal process. So if you're a company, uh, please check with your legal department before you go ahead with anything. And all of your code needs to be licensed with Apache 2 license. And there might be other licenses that they approved um, by CNCF, but Apache 2 is uh, what is recommended. And, um, all, and anyway, like you should like adopt something very permissive, right? The transfer uh, of the trademark to CNCF also doesn't mean uh, that you can't use it anymore. There are like clear policies uh, around how to use the trademark in a commercial product. And um, from our time, like when we're donating like Knative to, to CNCF, the big question for the company was, oh, can we use Knative in the name of our like Google branded service? And the answer is yes. There are like clear policies that you can follow and so can do like other vendors if they launch similar uh, products. Um, so knowing this, if you still want to move forward, um, uh, there are some requirements to join the sandbox. And uh, we'll categorize them into like three main uh, buckets. First is governance. Uh, like we said, uh, it's, there are not a lot of requirements. At this stage, you're just asked to adopt the CNCF code of conduct and have simple discoverable governance. It's worth mentioning that as you grow, these uh, requirements will change and CNCF like mapped out the whole journey um, and like things will change over time. Um, 
there are a few things that are not hard requirements uh, at this stage, but are really nice and useful to have even at this stage. And that is uh, light documentation and contributions and how to build your project, how to test and uh, what you expect from your contributors. And um, also ensure that uh, your project metadata and resources are all vendor neutral. So when you like usually start your project on your laptop or in your company, like it's all testing infra is uh, managed by you. And a good goal is to have that infra shareable um, so like others can join you in building your project once you are in the sandbox. And we've seen over and over like many projects struggle with just like vendor attached uh, infra. It can take a long time to move stuff out of vendor controlled CI into, you know, community owned CI. Yeah. Um, it's also good to have a discoverable communication channel. A lot of CNCF projects use Slack and you can use CNCF or Kubernetes Slack for your project. Like you just start a channel there and uh, you invite people to join there. Uh, and uh, probably at this stage uh, for your project, more than governance, it's important to have a clear proposition for your project. Uh, what it is, like, what is it exactly? What, what does it do? Is it real, like our Alpaca project? How does it fulfill the need in the cloud native ecosystem? And usually it will be a readme file in your repo or on your website, like landing page, if you have a website. Um, and it's not a requirement, but it's always a great idea to have cool demos for your project. Uh, can you show like in a concise manner, like why your project is awesome? And that's usually what gets like people convinced. And good guides for new users to pick up and use your project are also useful. Okay. So now we get to dive a little bit into the security requirements. Um, again, for joining the CNCF, it's pretty minimal. The biggest thing is that you have, you know, some access controls. So like things like 2FA, if you have, you know, org members, they don't all have admin access. Um, and while like this is the only requirement for Sandbox, there are a few things that like I highly recommend implementing early and they'll help you down the line. Uh, namely, uh, having a process for handling uh, vulnerability reports or other security issues. Uh, this can be as simple as like creating a security mailing list that um, a few of your maintainers are on. And you know, having a process for this is required for incubating. So getting it going early just sort of takes care of it uh, ahead of time later. Um, another useful thing that the you know is not strictly required at any level. Um, would be to actually set up uh, some sort of group secret manager, like 1Password or Keybase. You seriously would not believe the amount of secrets you can accumulate like quickly. You know, Zoom, CI, you know, Google Workspace. It's a lot easier to uh, have those in a secret manager from you know the get-go instead of trying to deal with it later. Um, like, trust me, it sucks trying to get creds out of a vendor account than the, the person left the vendor. <laughs> so. Uh, Alpaca has done their homework. They've created uh, some basic governance. They've checked their licenses, created a lightweight vulnerability triage process, and they think they're ready to apply. So, yes, it applies for Sandbox. It's pretty straightforward. Um, there's an issue template in the CNCF Sandbox repo um, with you know, all the questions that you need. The big thing I wanna call out is that there are a lot of people entering Sandbox and um, they essentially go into a queue to be reviewed by the TOC and they batch review them roughly every two months. Um, they will keep your issue updated with various labels that will indicate its state in the entire process. Um, I recommend checking out the uh, README in the uh, CNCF Sandbox repo and that will you know, cover it all. So Alpaca got pretty lucky. There wasn't a lot of projects in the queue. About two months later, you know, congrats. It's now a Sandbox project. Sandbox project, and you know, it's in the CNCF. It's excited. You know, they aren't even going to bother looking at the incubating stuff. They're going to look at you know graduated projects for you know inspiration for their governance, their policies, um, and they're going to you know talk to some of the maintainers there to get some good advice. So, like, don't just copy Kubernetes. <laughs> now, a lot of new projects look to it as the golden standard, and you know that's all well and good, and but they 
think they need to like implement its sort of structure, <clears throat> governance and policies uh, like word for word. And Kubernetes has uh, 10 years of, you know, history to sort of get where it is. And it's a very like big and large project. Now that's not to say there aren't pieces that are, you know, we're, we're great for smaller projects. And I'm sorry, I'm getting a phone call apparently. Um, and uh, so like, it's great to be inspired by like Kubernetes governance and Kubernetes policies, uh, but I really don't recommend just, you know, copying them at this time because you're, you're going to have a bad time. Um, okay, you know, Alpaca has heated the advice of other maintainers and scoped things down to just focus on the right priorities at, for this stage. And at this stage, we're still trying to find the market fit for Alpaca, right, and build our identity. And we focused on developing like solid use cases, like what are big problems or problem categories that we're trying to address. And we document them and, uh, and explain them very well. And we advocate for our project. Like we join all the meetup groups, we write blogs, we present uh, our project to different like audiences, and uh, uh, like we talk to different groups in CNCF and get feedback continuously and try to improve. We also need to uh, love and nurture our first users, and uh, luckily we have those because we got a really cute mascot and it really helps with acquiring new users. Um, and Users will always be our priority, right? But in early stages, uh, you will know them well, and it's really great opportunity for you to work closely with them, understand their pain points, and uh, yeah, like get really high quality feedback. And we use that feedback to build what users need, hopefully. And um, also in early stages, we uh, build features and try to build them fast. So it's good to stay lean. Uh, and keep simple development processes. Uh, but also it's very important to have a good, uh, reliable testing. And this will help you to build new features fast, but also make sure that the core of the project will always work as intended. And Sandbox is a safe environment to, to experiment, and you really need to experiment a lot. And not everything will be a hit. You might even end up changing your uh, vision for your project, um, and that's totally fine. Or you might uh, find new interesting use cases that can further solidify your belief in your project. And to help you grow, CNCF offers a few services. Uh, by the way, this uh, <laughs> we know that Costco is not uh, alpaca, it's llama, but it's pretty close, so we use him here. <laughs> Uh, but here's the list of the services uh, that CNCF provides for Sandbox projects, starting with CI/CD with some limitations, of course, ending with uh, supporting like you in events, uh, supporting you with documentation and design, like website development, so on and so forth. So you can check that link out for details. So uh, with your <laughs> great vision and your friends and CNCF support, um, things are going really great. <laughs> and maybe a few hundred PRs later, uh, you look around and think, what is next, right? And the next step for a project within CNCF is uh, to join the incubator. Um, and you're still in the sandbox and you have been working hard on your project priorities, which we mentioned earlier, but now we, to get to the next level, we need to do a bit more. Uh, specifically, you um, like you have built identity for your project, and now you want to solidify it by um, by uh, documenting real life production case studies. In fact, it's a requirement from the CNCF to go to the next level, and they want to see evidence of production usage of your project. Um, it's always a good idea to add a file um, where adapters of your project can add themselves easily. This is usually done uh, with an adapters MD file in your repo. And I think it's better to go beyond company uh, names and logos and actually interview them and document them into detailed case studies. And your readers will appreciate uh, technical details. And so go deep, don't be afraid to end up with five pages of case study, right? 
And these case studies will be your amazing marketing material. And um, they will help you to get more users who, uh, who relate to your uh, use case. And your users will always be your best advocates. So try to get as many of case studies as possible. Um, we talked about users earlier. Well, uh, as your project grows, some of the user, uh, some of your users will become your contributors. Sometimes it's hard to keep up with everything, so issues, pull requests. So you need to have clear processes for validating and accepting contributions. A good tip is to have a good issue template, and uh, so your users submit uh, issues properly, and you can uh, triage them easily and faster. Finally, uh, while you used to focus on building and shipping lots of features really fast, at this stage you probably need to start prioritizing stability more highly. A roadmap uh, can be a useful tool, and um, it's not a hard requirement from the CNCF just yet, uh, but it can help you to communicate and set some expectations with the users uh, on what is coming next. Um, Okay, so we have worked, worked to mature our project and we think we're ready to graduate uh, from the CNC of Sandbox. And how do we actually do it? Well, to move to the next level, uh, you will be asked to fill out DD, which uh, stands for Due Diligence Document. And the purpose of this document is to provide uh, the TOC the information that they, they need on your project, organized really nicely and made readily available. So they can form their opinion whether you're ready to move to the next level or not. And this document also helps uh, them to drive consensus um, when they're taking the decision. And there will be many questions asked um, and like, uh, what is the purpose of the project? What are the primary use cases? What are the like performance or governance or security considerations? So we will dive into those requirements a bit more here. Okay, so starting with the governance requirements um, for like the requirements for incubation uh, aren't that bad. It's mostly just documenting a few things and demonstrating that you've had growth. So you know maybe more members uh, from like various different organizations uh, you'll be able to get like more information from like dev stats um there's they're all like are all just kinds of things that or these are all just kinds of things that just kind of like evolve with the project as you as it matures um but similar to before there's a few things that you can like implement here that will really help you in the long run um first thing is like documenting your contributor life cycle. Um, this is technically a graduation requirement, but it's very useful to implement earlier. Um, a contributor life cycle or sort of creating the policies around what defines a contributor, how they can join the org, become a member or a maintainer, and when they should be, you know, potentially moved to emeritus status and removed. Um, it's useful to implement early in the project's life, sort of like once they've started to firm up their identity and are, you know, in the page where, or in the stage where they're going to be potentially adding a lot more people to the project. It removes a lot of the ambiguity around becoming an ORC member um, and defines like, you know, various sort of activity requirements to, to you know, continue to be an ORC member. Um, on the removal side, it's, you know, it's not fun to remove people from a project, but it's important and necessary. Having people in the org potentially with elevated permissions that aren't doing anything there is a legitimate security risk. Um, the other thing is like people are, you know, allowed to grow or, you know, have, you know, other life situations. There, you know, things might change and take them away from the project. And, you know, this just helps sort of, uh, you know, defines it and can help like um, remove like stem off any sort of like conflict that might arise if someone is, you know, potentially uh, has their rights pulled from being an admin or removed from the org. Um, for Alpaca, uh, they've decided to like to be an org member. You must sustain 50 dev stats contributions a year or actively serve in a non-code role to, you know, stay on as an org member. You know, people might nitpick what a meaningful contribution is, but there's a big difference from, you know, a single typo fix to, you know, opening a PR with a design proposal. Um, so now these requirements may change in the future, but it gives Alpaca a good base to work with. 
Um, another thing that isn't a requirement at any level, but is very useful, is a contributor ladder. So similar to documenting the life cycle as sort of like entry exit criteria, um, a contributor ladder complements it by creating you know, roles and paths for maintainers into you know, leadership. So many projects you know, start out giving you know, all org members uh, right or admin access, um, or like with merge rights, but that really doesn't scale well as you grow. So having a ladder with defined conditions um, like on um, what sort of knowledge does it take to you know to have a new contributor move to a org member or maintainer and or to give them you know merge rights um, can just like really really help there um, it gives contributors a growth path and can re reduce instances of like you know why was that person granted admin access or why was that person promoted to you know a leader instead of me so quickly going back to our fluffy little packaging project, uh, they've decided to you know, delegate giving people merge rights to the code owners for an area or repo, and uh, with it requiring you know, two leads uh, to sign off or a simple majority of say the you know, root owners in the event that a you know, lead for that area isn't available or is um, no longer active. Uh, next on the like, you know, technical docs fronts, um, technical docs and processes front. Uh, most of the requirements here, um, you know, again, sort of like just naturally evolve as the project matures. The big thing is just remembering to document them. Uh, you, you wouldn't believe how many projects, like, you know, these, these naturally things happen, but they don't actually document them. And just doing that can, like, save you a lot of stre stress later, especially when going, you know, for uh, bumping up to the next level. So um, one of the things that's, like, not mentioned here is licenses. Um, this has really bitten multiple projects in the rear and has caused problems when they go to try and move to the next level. They'll accidentally import a dependency with an incompatible license. Um, and it's, you know, it is possible to get exceptions, but that can take a long time and requires both the governing board, like lawyers and the governing board to sign off and you're, you're talking you know, months to get that taken care of. Um, it's easier, honestly, just to like implement a process or CI check to prevent that sort of thing in the first place. Okay, with that other way, uh, let's cover the, the last thing, security requirements, yay. So um, we covered the security vulnerability port and so like triage process earlier. Um, the remaining things for incubation are like the, the uh, open SSF best practices badge, which is, isn't really security related, but just has a you know, bunch of, of things you should be doing already. Like, are you releasing with a version scheme? Is your, are your docs up to date? Do you have an SSL certificate? You know, fairly, fairly basic things. Um, and then the last thing is a uh, self-assessment, a security self-assessment um, using the sort of process created by TAG uh, Security. And it's really there just to make sure you are following um, security-minded best, like development best practices. Um, you can see, like check it out in the CNCF TAG Security repo for a bit of info. Okay, deep breath. Uh, that's, that's a lot. Um, but let's come back to, you know, Alpaca. At this point, the DD doc is done. They've gone back and like documented the things that were missing. Um, a lot of the things, you know, they were already doing, they just, you know, weren't written down. So they apply for it. And after, you know, some more time in the queue with a whole slew of other projects, the, the TUC gets to vote and has approved Alpaca for incubating. Um, lots of people are happy with that. You know, turns out the whole, you know, middle out compression thing uh, works out pretty well. There's even this Pied Piper company that's interested in it. <laughs> yeah. Good. No, good. Uh, so it's a huge milestone, right? So we take our time to celebrate it with our friends. We uh, organize a meetup, go to local events. We share our journey and plan for all the exciting future. Uh, so when you hit such a milestone, please be proud of yourself. Take your time to celebrate and recognize and reward the contributors who help you get there. And once you officially join the incubation, the priorities of your project will be well supported by the processes that you set up everything that Bob mentioned. Um, and at this point, uh, you'll be experimenting a lot less, right? Now it's time to introduce more controls and processes around releases. And growth is still uh, important, but you want to make sure that you have a path for people to grow, and that's where the ladder that Bob mentioned uh, is really uh, useful. Um, also, this might 
like be a great checkpoint for you to revisit your governance, right? You have a lot of people involved in the project for working from different organizations, geographies, time zones. So it's very important to have a formalized decision making for each part of your project, like how, your, uh, how you vote on new features, how you uh, make changes in the community like management, or how do you veto certain decisions and all of that uh, needs to have a formalized approach. Uh, on top of those processes, now you get to access uh, to more support from CNCF. Uh, this support can help you achieve the user and contributor growth and bring more awareness to your project. So you get to participate in CNCF collocated events like, Cube, uh, like KubeCon. You can have your own small conference like Istio Day or ArgoCon. Um, and you also get um, help with like running community service or more help with documentation, etc. Um, but incubation is a process and your project will be part of it for a while, uh, at least a year. Some, usually it takes more like three, four years. Uh, you will continue to build your project, grow your users, uh, your contributors, uh, release uh, quality software, deal with a lot of bugs and open issues and always wish that you were documenting more things. Um, you will continue this journey and after some time, <laughs> you will want to go for graduation. Everyone does. Um, graduation is the last official milestone within uh, CNCF and, um, and the graduation indicates the maturity and long-term health of your project. So again, uh, we find ourselves in a similar situation uh, where we look into requirements. Um, at this stage, you hopefully got all the basics when it comes to software management, uh, like releases, issue, triage, security, and you do those things really, really well. To go for graduation, uh, you also need to demonstrate that the governance of your project ensures uh, vendor neutrality and long-term survivability. So CNCF looks into the diversity of vendors who participate in your project and how the decisions are made. And uh, to make sure that the project meets uh, this criteria, we <laughs> go back to our uh, favorite yeah, process. And actually, we talked a lot about what requirements we need, uh, but we haven't spent a lot of time sharing why there are such requirements. Well, CNCF is 501C6, uh, and ultimately it's responsible to its members. The governing board and TOC are extensions of that. So members join CNCF to ensure they have a voice and get reliable, scalable, predictable uh, software that is vendor neutral with transparent processes, um, ensuring decisions are made in the open. And this is more important for graduation than any other level uh, because it signals that the project is ready for uh, widespread adoption. Okay, uh, so a pack is in the home stretch here. Um, you'll actually find there isn't a lot more things for it to actually do. Uh, the main thing is now, again, you just like must document these things like any sort of like leadership path and how your people are promoted. Uh, similar thing here for technical processes. Uh, if you have a roadmap or some other way of tracking your enhancements, uh, something like you want to have something like Python PEPs or Kubernetes KEPs, um, just some way to show that um, you know docs are getting reviewed or designs are getting reviewed, and you know give people time to make suggestions and changes. Um, one other thing I will say, um, it's easy to fall in the trap of making things too complicated or convoluted, and you don't want to make it impossible for people to propose, uh, you know, work and to do on like new features. So you need to balance usability and gathering the information uh, needed to review and track your enhancements. Um, last thing, the security audit. Uh, the CNCF has partnered with like multiple vendors um, that can help you perform it. Um, the biggest thing is like just be available for them, and it'll help speed things along. So Alpac has been diligent, things going well, which means it's time for graduation. Um, we're running a little uh, slow on time, but I promise we're close to being done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're officially graduated project, right? And with this status, we get a bit like more support from CNCF, but it's not a lot more. Um, I 
I will try to be fast. <laughs> <laughs> so the graduation status is uh, basically a reaffirmation from CNCF of the maturity of the project and its community. So you're stable, you're used in production all over the place, and you must be winning, right? Now what? <laughs> what we do after that? And um, well, often by now your project is a few years old, and there's broadly uh, a shift in priorities. Okay, so this is where things really start to change. Um, you're being used in a lot of production environments. Uh, people want to know that you know they can upgrade and roll back. That you know if there's an issue, there's logging and troubleshooting. Um, you 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 are you know naturally trending towards you know more stability. You know, the other thing is like your code base might be large and more complex, and things can slow down. And overall, your project you know kind of becomes boring. Um, but that's kind of expected, you're stable. Um, and hopefully you have like the various technical controls in there to help you at that point. Um, and honestly, it's just a big part of being a more mature project. Um, the other thing at this point is you don't have as many good first issues and getting up to your speed in your code base takes longer. Uh, by now for one, more, one reason or another, people you know, might be leaving the project. Um, you're, you're like, you're out of the phase of just trying to get like more contributors, and now you need to find the balance between your current contributors, your maintainers, and recruiting new people. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't just stop trying to get new people coming in, but you should be more intentional about it and where to direct them. And uh, like, you need to know where in the project to actually do that. And part of the problem is, you know, we all love our projects. Um, we love the people in, in them. And like I've said it before and I'll say it again, but like open source is how you make friends in your 30s. Um, <laughs> but because we love our projects, uh, we don't want to let it or our friends down. So it's a lot easy to bend, it's, it's fall, easy to fall into like bending over backwards for it instead of finding a productive way to say, you know, we're down to one person here. Um, this, like, hopefully you have, you know, a good ladder and you have some community members in the wings that can, you know, sort of, you know, backfill some of those people. But it's uh, a good time to, like, think about, you know, how you can streamline more things for your maintainers. They're going to be, you know, low, lower on time. Um, the other thing in, when it comes to streamlining is it includes your governance. Just because you graduated doesn't mean you shouldn't reassess your policies and make sure that they, you know, work for you, the support, you know, the work for you at the project at that point in time. You know, if it doesn't, marry conduit, and you know, if it doesn't spark joy, time to revisit. Okay, so by graduation, you should have pretty comprehensive documentation. Uh, you'll have your own website, uh, but you need to think more about how you communicate the state of your project. Um, publishing information on you know the wins and risks may seem kind of odd for a long-term sustainability but trust me its importance can't be overstated uh, many maintainers participating as are, are participating as part of their job duties and quite often they literally have to justify uh, why they should be allowed to continue to contribute uh, so like with a list you know of achievements a maintainer can say hey this is what I helped do and why it's worth it for me to continue to contribute um, and if they aren't doing it for the day job, it's a good thing to include on their resume. Uh, the other part of it is looking at the risks. You know, people will just assume you're well-staffed um, and everything is going smoothly unless you surface it in some way. Uh, if I'm an end user and like Alpaca or another project is critical to my environment, um, you know, we're not going to commit resources unless there is some way, like, some way that signals that it is. Um, so the other thing, other aspect of like uh, communicating all this, well, first, like the risks and achievements, you know, complement each other. But when it comes to communicating these things, uh, we're all very, very technical, and we tend to communicate in very, very technical ways. But a lot of the people that are making the decisions on allocating headcount or doing this stuff aren't going to understand that stuff. So you need to think about how you can rephrase what you are doing to like really reach them. The, the big point in all this is like it actually all boils down to being transparent. Uh, everyone wants growth and to look like they're great and a healthy project, but it doesn't help to you know, hide when there are issues. Being transparent can you know, buy your maintainers some grace because like, there's certainly a lot of assholes out there, but I swear most people like, have a bit more empathy and are more forgiving to, sl to like, slow repies or slow reviews when they know you're down to like one person. Okay. 
So you might think you've graduated, you documented everything, everything that Bob covered, and you set up all the necessary processes, the project is healthy, you have maintainers, everything is great. So you might think, oh, I'm done, right? But as we've seen, there's not the real magical end state, and it's ever-changing thing that needs to be managed. And the journey will continue, and you will think it might look like this straight line from now on. But actually, um, like everything else, it will be bumpy, and there will be lots of ups and downs, and there will be big wins and issues, and you're not going to win them all. But building a solid foundation uh, with a mind for sustainability and being able to adapt, uh, adapt as things go, come along um, can turn your hurdles from something like this to this. And with that, we're done, yay. <laughs> th 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 thanks for uh, putting up with us going over for a little bit. Yeah, it was too much. <laughs>